Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Global Connections Television is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We'd invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with a PBS or community access television station, or perhaps an educational institution that has an intra campus television hookup, or you like our shows, you have your own website, and you would like to share them, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided free of charge as a public service to help us better understand international issues. Today we're going to talk about issues on how communities, it doesn't matter if you're living in Rapid City, North Dakota, South Dakota, or if you're in Frankfurt, Kentucky, or Frankfurt, Germany, Lima, Ohio, or Lima, Peru, it makes no difference, but there are ways to deal with problems, and that's what we're going to talk about today, and my guest is an expert in this area. Dr. Albert Linder Linderman is the CEO of Sages Corporation. He is a cultural anthropologist who is guiding community change and leadership transitions. Dr. Albert Linderman, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you, great to be here. I appreciate you being with me. Thank you so much. We're gonna get into this very interesting topic. Let's talk about Sages for a mm -hmm. moment. What is the Sages Corporation? Um, we started Sages about 20 years ago with the understanding that there's some deep uh, wisdom that leaders have, that communities have, that is hard to get at because when you have lived for a number of years doing something, working in an area, you've got a lot of embedded knowledge and wisdom that's hard to get out and have it be articulated in a way that's uh, can be useful for others. And so part of uh, what Sages uh, did when we started was we knew how to get at that deep tacit knowledge that leaders have. So transitions from people who are uh, leading organizations or communities and they're, they're going to transition out, they're retiring or whatever, they're moving on. Uh, what wisdom have they learned in terms of navigating their role that is going to help them uh, th that would help uh, their successor and help the community, and you don't want to lose that intelligence. So that's part of the transition work we do. In terms of communities, our belief is that there's a great deal of intelligence and creativity in the community as a whole, but you've got to get the community to together to share, to get that out, and then you can create uh, ways to uh, deal with community issues that you weren't able to deal with. Mm -hmm. And our viewers can go to sagescorp.com? It is, it is actually uh, sagescorp.com, yes. Okay, great, very good. Now, in 2012, you published or you wrote a book, a very interesting mm -hmm. book. What was the title of it, and what yeah. was the thrust of it? Um, so the name is Why the World Around You Isn't As It Appears. And very it, appropriate. <laughs> yes. Very appropriate. Um, it's really all about how, um, so, I, so I have an anthropology background, mm -hmm. and I've long known that people who grow up in a different way, uh, a, di a different part of the world, very often see the world in different ways. Particularly, I've been intrigued by how uh, indigenous peoples of the world have a, a very different experience of day-to-day -day life than people who have been raised in a more Western educated uh, way. And, so part of that is that indigenous people see flows and they see energy much more. So it's more of a, if you will, a verb-based world. They have very, uh, very few nouns compared to Western languages. We're full of nouns. The English language has more nouns than any language in the history of the earth, and it has a, a higher percentage of nouns. And one of the things nouns do is it, it limits you, so it helps you so we're technologically incredible, but we're also a little limited. And so how can uh, a community take the best of what it has in terms of its people and ways of looking at things and create um, um, what will be a society that will be sustainable long term? Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And well, let's take Rapid City, South Dakota. You've done a lot of work in that area and many other areas too. But to take that as a sort of an example and tie that into your book and looking at verbs versus the nouns yeah. approach yeah. to dealing with communal problems such as homelessness, hunger, whatever the case might be. Yeah, so the, um, there's an approach that's called community-based system dynamics. Uh, system dynamics uh, was, uh, initiated at MIT about 50, 60 years ago. And it's a little bit misleading of a term. System makes people think of technology, which is actually just that 
everything's interconnected, so it's a system. And the dynamics part is this verb-based piece, that there are flows between various aspects of a system, and you need to understand the flows and how they affect and influence each other in order to determine if you're trying to solve problems or create something new, what are we going to work on to help create something new? So, Rapid City, uh, we, uh, we wanted to understand, the, the, the goal was create uh, an improvement in quality of life for all citizens of Rapid City, a very uh, robust goal. And in order to do that, we needed to get, if you will, the whole elephant in the room. We, so, we, uh, after we learned how the social service network of that city works, um, we brought together um, government leaders, nonprofit leaders, faith community leaders, uh, business leaders, um, and a number of regular citizens, some of whom had had struggles in their life, but we worked with them for a 24-hour period, three, three days of eight hours each. Uh, we had the mayor, the police chief, all in the room where uh, we did a history of Rapid City. How did it get to be here? We uh, began to understand what are the factors that influence life in Rapid City, how are they connected, and the wisdom that was in the room collectively was far superior than what any individual could come up with. And so during that three-day workshop, we created a uh, shared language and built, built models of how homelessness influences housing, which influences economic development, which influences family life, which influences native, non-native relations, which influences behavioral health, and how, how they're connected to each other. And the, the, so again, something that could not have been done by an individual, uh, an entire community created a model that now they shared the same language, Everybody in the room, native leaders with, um, with those who were civic leaders, could talk the same language and begin to see what can we do about some of the issues in Rapid City that uh, are, are challenging for the city, great city, but they have challenges like every community, and what can we do to make it better? And, and so we've seen some really good results from this. It certainly sounds like it. When you were describing that, that reminded me of a program, an international program that operates on the same lines. You brought all the stakeholders together. Yes. Everybody who is remotely involved yep. in Rapid City in any type of activity, business, whatever, educators, it reminded me of a, a United Nations educational, scientific, and cultural organization program called Man in the Biosphere Program. Mm -hmm. And they are invited into an area like Mammoth Cave, Kentucky. Mammoth Cave is a beautiful area of pristine caves, but it was becoming very polluted back in the early 90s. And they invited UNESCO in, and UNESCO came in and brought all the stakeholders together, the federal, state, local officials, educators, business community, the farmers, critical player right. in, this, in that area and they hammered out a strategic plan. Yep. And it's actually working today, and, and UNESCO has done that in many parts of the world. But that is critical to being successful, is it not? To that's bring a, them all together? That's a perfect example, a comparison of what we did in Rapid City. As far as we know, there hasn't been any, any other initiative quite like the Rapid City mm -hmm. work uh, that is ongoing. It's called Rapid City Collective Impact. And it, it, it is critical. Um, you, everybody's self-protective. I mean, it's human nature to be <laughs> self-protective. And uh, only when you see a vision for what could be and how, if we work together more effectively, uh, efficiently, and we collaborate in ways we haven't done before, we can actually solve some of our community problems. So yes, it, it sounds very similar. What were, anytime there's social change, anytime you yeah. bring people together, they're always not going to agree on everything. Did, were there certain areas of tension or fears, perhaps, of, of the unknown as they were going through this deliberative process? Well, uh, certainly there was, there's this resistance, potential resistance, concerned about self-protection. So organizations, so some of the nonprofits were concerned, well, um, if, if we um, get in, too involved, then are we going to be needed um, later, I mean, are we, am, am I working myself out of a job? And in some ways, nonprofits are set up that way. They have mission and they, they have a goal to solve this problem or that problem. And yet, they're also fearful of losing, I, I mean, these are families. You know, these people um, that work and run nonprofits, they care about uh, their staff. And so, 
so there's that resistance. There's, there was some resistance in the community, I think, because we'd never had in Rapid City, there there'd not been any significant native, non-native initiative uh, uh, that was co-run, uh, co co-designed, and to do that for the first time, uh, there's skepticism about whether that was possible or not, and yet, uh, it was possible, and it, and it is happening because of the 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 process that we took, which took a took a lot of talking time, uh, where the stakeholders got together, and they they were realizing every step of the way we are co-creating something we've not ever seen before, and this is great. This is the way to go. Very good. Now, you've been involved in previous projects with a colleague of ours, Rick Smyer from yep. North Carolina, in a Cities of the Future project. What exactly was that, and what was the thrust of it, and how does it tie into what you're doing today? Well, it's, um, it's, it's an ongoing uh, um, approach with uh, Cities of the Future. Uh, Rick uh, has become aware of my work in um, collective impact in communities, and I've got a couple other I could talk about. If we, you know, if we get to it, we can talk about child hunger in suburbs, et cetera. But oh, sure. um, Rick was very aware of, of my work and invited me to be part of uh, the Cities of the Future uh, Collaborative, um, and and our um, our concept is that communities all can solve their own issues if they will, in fact, get everybody in the room and have a chance to design a strategic plan um, that, um, that, that leverages the wisdom that is in the community. And so with one community addressing a lot of issues and then another community, is community in Alabama and there's community in Minnesota um, that I've worked with, both of whom uh, have somewhat similar problems and some different issues of, of Rapid City. But the, the leadership of these varied communities, can they begin to connect in ways, so urbanologists, but also regular citizens um, or sector leaders in the faith community, in the business community, et cetera, can they talk together to create, uh, to help each other solve problems? So this is part of a linking of communities uh, initiative. Now, another project is, ties into all of this is the unleashing of the 21st century narrative. Yeah. And again, this is a different way to look at solving these problems. Maybe, as you say, maybe moving from a noun-based approach to a verb-based approach to something like that. What, is, what will be some of the major challenges that will arise in moving forward with this discussion? Um, in any community, there's got to be a narrative that is compelling. So work that I've been doing with uh, child hunger in suburbs. Um, there's a growing need uh, for uh, attention to, it, it's becoming a public health issue uh, for the, the, the United States that uh, suburbs of our major cities have not, uh, don't have the infrastructure, don't have um, the expertise to address the changing demographics that are taking place in, in suburbs. And so there, there's a growing child hunger need in suburbs that's growing faster than anywhere else in the country. In fact, urban centers are doing a very good job of addressing child hunger. Suburban communities are just beginning to look into it. And so, um, part of this whole process of uh, bringing stakeholders together, you, you've got to create a narrative. The narrative is, we got more than enough food in this country. The narrative is, it's not right that children are going hungry. The narrative is, we need to be able to feed the kids for many reasons. For the kids' benefit, because there are bad health outcomes. If you don't, they don't do well in school. Kids don't if they're not well fed. Isn't it interesting that certain schools in the suburbs I've been working with, and I think it's all over the nation, they will feed the kids on the day they're gonna get uh, the state level testing. They'll make sure every kid eats that day. Well, why are they doing that? Because the proof, it's been proven, kids do better. And yet, we've got kids coming, hung, uh, coming to school hungry every day uh, in suburbs across the country. So what do we, get? so you, you start to get the narrative in the, in the, um, in the suburb and then people say, this isn't right. We've got to do something about this. Now, there's resistance. 
So here's the resistance. Resist resistance is a community. We don't want to be known as a community that's got a lot of child hunger. We don't want this to get out. And then the school district says, well, if everybody thinks we've got a problem in our school district, then they're going to go send their kids to the, ne to the next community school district. So there's a resistance to even get the message out. So there's a ton of stigma in the suburbs around child hunger. So the idea, though, is if you've got a strong enough narrative, people will say it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that this might make us look bad. This is wrong that we've got hungry kids, we've got to do something about it. And then you get into trying to understand, well, there might be systemic reasons why there's hunger in suburbs, and what can we do to change that? Mm -hmm. And this is something we have to focus on. Now, as you mentioned, the urban areas seem to be doing a, be a better job as far as dealing with it. And I know they have this backpack program and yep. giving kids food and what have you, but that's still not dealing with the root problem. That's It helps, it helps. but it's still not quite there. And how, how much of a role does income inequality play in this? We've been hearing more and more about this, how the middle class is shrinking. It's really uh, being gutted to a large degree. Yep. And a large part of it is because of this income inequality. But what, what factor does that play into it? There's two issues with the income inequality. So the, the first one is the, the folks who are working full time and they're making $12 an hour, maybe $13 an hour. And that puts them at a level where if they have two children, they're going to be able to qualify for four or $500 of benefit, government benefits, usually state and low, uh, uh, federal benefits, to help them because it's not enough. It's, you can't live on, on a full-time salary and you're making $13 an hour. It's not enough to live. However, that very same family, that very same individual or uh, get, uh, person with the children gets a dollar an hour raise. So they're up to $14 an hour. This is great, except that's $160 a month. And now they don't qualify for the $500 a month that mm -hmm. they get. And so, so there's a disincentive the way things are set up. So that's one category of income inequality. It's not livable wage, which is why you see um, communities all over the country uh, trying to move towards a, a $15 an hour uh, minimum wage because that's getting to the low level of livability. The other income inequality, though, uh, that you find in suburbs a lot are um, the episodic times of poverty times of poverty where you've got a medical problem, you lose your job for some reason, um, you've got a disability that happens to either you or somebody in your family, you've got to take care of an aging parent, uh, you have a major expense that you aren't prepared for, and you get knocked down where you don't even have enough money for food. And I cannot tell you, the research I did with a small team in suburbs of the Twin Cities, you, you would not believe how many people are in that boat. They don't want anybody to know, and yet they've got to go to the food shelf mm -hmm. to get food. And very often, there's not a food shelf even close. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a real difficult challenge in suburbs. It certainly is. You mentioned the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Yep. Paul, yes. Minnesota. That's right. Major players, major cities in the United yep. States. Now, what we're talking about are cities primarily in the U.S., but this could apply anywhere, just about any place. Exactly. It could yeah. certainly do that. And uh, hopefully other folks will gain ideas from today's conversation. I'm sure you're looking at what's going on in other places. When we're talking about the uh, social assistance program, do we need to revamp the whole thing? As you mentioned, if you get a dollar raise, you lose your you lose your food stamps or you mm -hmm. lose or whatever it is, some yep. other type of service. Mm -hmm. Do we need to look at how we're providing these services, the safety net, and just rework the whole thing? Well, in my opinion, yes. We, yeah. <laughs> we, we certainly do because it's yes. not working for people. It's a disincentive. Uh -huh. It frustrates everybody who's in that boat. Mm -hmm. uh, it's some hard... Uh, couple I talked to, both working full time, uh, they have four children, they can't mm -hmm. make it because they're making $12 an hour. They, they, they are the s hardest working people you ever want to meet, and yet they have to get help. That's not right. Mm -hmm. No, it's true. And that's today, instead of the middle class, we're saying the working poor yeah. is part of the middle class, a large part of it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's really tragic what's happening. And again, it's not just in the United States, but no. it's other parts of the it world is. too. The, um, before I, I don't want to get too far along. I know you've been doing some international work also. Yeah. You were in Cairo, Egypt, mm -hmm. helped set up a university. Is that yes, correct? Yes, that's right. What, what exactly was that university? What was the name of it? And how did you get involved in that? Yeah. Um, 
The university uh, is in Cairo named um, Heliopolis University mm -hmm. for Sustainable Development. Um, the seventh university of Egypt, so if you think for a minute that 90 million people and there's only seven universities, very difficult to get one established. The, the uh, founder of that university took 10 years to get it through the system <laughs> to get that thing set up. But um, I had the privilege of, I played a small part, but over two summers um, I spent time there with um, the faculty and the administrators as we were establishing, as they were establishing, we were establishing this university. Uh, with the whole goal in mind of uh, a university where every student understands that um, sustainable development is, is the future to save the planet. Mm -hmm. um, everything, every major, and so they do have business and they do have med uh, medical um, degrees, but it's uh, designed with uh, every student understands that um, we have a very precious planet. And I, I'd have to say, Egypt has a better sense of that maybe than we do in the United States because their natural resources are quite limited compared to ours. Mm -hmm. And they see uh, the effects um, of climate change there as well, uh, and how, um, uh, and, and this particular community has been instrumental. Uh, just brief story, uh, this, the, the founder of this community um, started a type of uh, farming of cotton in, in Egypt where it was desert, and he created the best cotton farms in Egypt. And he did it by uh, this type of farming called biodynamic, which is sort of an organic farming that's sort of, uh, uh, I don't know, on steroids, organic farming on steroids, whatever, <laughs> but, but no pesticides at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, over a period of time, the Minister of Agriculture of Egypt saw how amazing this, this uh, um, production was and the quality of the cotton. And so he, he gave them a three-year testing. They passed. Uh, with flying colors and then he announced, the Minister of Agriculture, to all the farmers, uh, I'm going to give you all incentives to convert to this method, method because the, it's no pesticides. And so immediately uh, in the newspapers the next day was this challenge to this community. Um, there had been stories planted and didn't know they were planted, but it turned out they were planted by uh, some uh, multinational uh, chemical companies who were afraid of losing their contracts. But the, the challenge was that this community was, um, uh, was anti-Islam, and, and they weren't. In fact, then the, the, the imams met with, with the founder uh, and eventually blessed it. And so then most of the farms in Egypt today are, are biodynamic, organic, cotton farms, so Egyptian cotton is primarily now um, pesticide free, which is a great thing. So anyway, that's a little story of the sustainable development idea that's behind that university. That's a great story. Yeah. <laughs> that is yeah. a fantastic story because it, it sounds as though that every profession, be it the medical profession, accounting, the legal, whatever, at that university, they brought in sustainable development. And they that did. really should be done in every university, every high school, every middle school, grade school, kindergarten, all around the world, because we see the tragic results that are taking place right now, especially through co climate change. It's yeah. absolutely yeah. devastating what's going on. So, it, it's, And that was several years ago you did that. It was established um, in 2013. 2013, mm -hmm. yes, a little avant-garde for, for at that particular time. Yep. Yeah, well, it's yep. very good, yes. Well, as you look forward, now you're a futurist, you're, yes. you're a, a, a oh, um, anthropologist, mm -hmm. you're a variety of things, an urban planner to some degree, social change agent, yep. you're all of those, all of the above, shall we say. But what do you see as the major challenges as you move forward in this area? And, and you've talked about some of them up to this point, but just in a more generic sense, what are we, what are we going to be looking at as we really plunge into the 21st century in dealing with these problems? It's, a, it's perhaps a dual approach. One is um, a, a sort of a global approach, so, so learning globally. And, and coordinating globally. But, but I really think uh, I've, I've been spending several years now in local communities. So uh, communities can do a great deal more than they're currently doing. They're very inefficient. Uh, there are gaps in their service. So in Rapid City, we had, um, uh, we knew that, that food insecurity was, a, was an issue when there were hungry people in Rapid City. We brought together the 23 organizations that had a pantry or a food shelf or provided meals, uh, hot meals, uh, at least once a week. We brought them all together in a room to start to coordinate and talk about the fact that, uh, well, there's actually all sorts of hungry people in Rapid City and why? 
And the 23 organizations met together and they basically never even met before. <laughs> and they're all in the same issue, uh, dealing with the same challenge. And why can't we coordinate those 23 organizations? Well, today they are coordinated. They were not at the time. But that's the kind of change that local communities need to start to collaborate in this. And, and, and the collective impact, I haven't talked to, and I won't go into too many details of what that is, but that's a particular approach to having all sectors of a community work together to solve problems. And it does work. It takes time. People, and this is, the challenge is, of course, elected officials, uh, city councils, et cetera, um, they're only there two years, four years, and so they want things to happen right now. And some of these challenges, we didn't get into this mess, uh, you know, communities have challenges. They didn't get those challenges overnight. It took a while for things to get there. It's going to take a while to work out. And a lot of times there's not the public will or the will uh, of the leaders to, uh, to do what it takes to, to work through uh, the issue and, and actually solve and improve the, the, the problems. And so that's part of the role of a narrative. Uh, and you, you, you've got to create a narrative that's so powerful, so morally compelling, that we need to deal with these issues in this community. And when you get that uh, at a high enough level, then you'll see a community move, which is what I've seen happen. Exactly. And you really need the three C's, collaboration, coordination, and communication yep. to make that happen, to bring all of these stakeholders together because they do have a vested interest in working on these particular problems. And if they don't coordinate together, it's just like the nations of the world. Yep. There's no one or two or three or four nations going to eliminate climate change right. or deal with human trafficking or deal with the AIDS yep. epidemic or the Ebola virus, right. whatever the case might be. You've got to have a collaboration. You have to come together and work as a collective force in order to overcome these problems, because if we don't, we're going to fail miserably. And as you mentioned, we've got to focus on the planet because there is, as one former Secretary General said at the UN, there is no planet B. <laughs> I mean, this exactly. is it. And people say, well, we'll just fly off to Mars or yep. someplace. Well, good luck on that. That's yep. not going to happen either. But Dr. Albert Linderman, this has been a fascinating topic and it's one that we need to learn much more about. And I want to thank you so much for a very interesting and thank a very you. informative program. Pleasure to be with you. Thank, thank you. you so much. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.